Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm continuing the analysis into Occupy Wall Street and its relationship to social theory in general. The book that I'm using is Social Theory, the Multicultural and Classic Readings, 3rd edition, a uh, very good book. I'm in section 4.1 of the analysis, titled Radical Democracy Alternatives for a New Left. What I want to do before I actually begin this section is to sort of bring us back up to date with respect to what transpired in Section 4. In Section 4, what we recognize was, according to the authors, the specific intent of introducing inequality via liberal conservatism into the social nexus. The attempt was to introduce inequality into the social nexus under the guise of um, fairness under the guise of um, the responsibility that individuals have for themselves and their own. And the example that I gave was one of neighborhood schools, right? I'm not here to pick sides. I'm not here to say who's right or who's wrong as much as I am here to sort of just flesh out the argument. I'll let you make a decision as to what you believe. That, that's, that's not the point. I think more importantly, however, for the authors, was a recognition that these inequalities are introduced for the purpose of structuring a hierarchic society, right? A, a society wherein there are haves and have-nots. So that it's important to recognize from section four, because you're not going to make sense of section 4.1 if you don't get this, that the whole point of introducing these inequalities is to greater separate, greater demarcate those who have the 1% from those who don't have the 99%. So that's what's at stake in section 4.1, and uh, let's begin our analysis. So this is Occupy Wall Street. T and an introduction to social theory. And this is section 4.1. So um, this is the first sense of the analysis is an attempt to recognize, uh, before I get into like the explicit account of it, sort of just conceptually, the attempt to recognize privilege within a social movement. It's a very important part, uh, a very, very important point, right? And the question is, is there privilege in a social movement? If you answer yes to yes, there is in fact privilege positions and privilege in a social movement, well, you would have to recognize then that individuals who are part of the revolution, meaning the revolutionary, there would be privileged subject positions, right? You, it would be, for example, a privilege to be, a benefit to be in a social movement that spoke to those positions that you were a representative of. What in the world does that mean? Right? And how does that apply to Occupy Wall Street. I'll explain it clearly because I think this was a pretty interesting. Um, this is a pretty interesting account that I think needs to be understood in order to make sense of what's at stake here because it's not apparently clear at first, at least. So I'm going to talk about three struggles that have three struggles um, which have historically been privileged. Right. So three privileged positions. Actually, struggles, let's be specific. Three privileged struggles. Okay, and this is not for me, this is from the author. The first is classism. The second is statism. And the third is economism. Alright, so classism. Statism, economism, the three privileged struggles. Obviously, um, if we are talking about a class revolt, a class revolution based on inequalities in, let's say, labor, disenfranchisement from the products of our creation, um, inequalities in the distribution of profits, you know, money pulled into the top, never really trickling down, that type of, that type of account. If that's the case, 
then obviously the privileged subject, the privileged revolutionary, is going to be the laborer, right? The laborer is in the privileged position for a labor revolt. So let's go through and look at what the author says with respect to these three privileged struggles. Um, and it'll make sense of the struggles themselves. And then I'll apply it to a broader discussion of both Occupy Wall Street movement um, and social theory. So the first is classism. Quote, the idea that the working class represents the privileged agent in which the fundamental impulse of society change resides. Right? So social change resides within the working class. And obviously the working class is comprised of laborers in a labor movement. Number two, statism. The idea that the expansion of the role of the state is the panacea of all problems. Right? The idea that the expansion of the role of the state is the panacea of all problems. So we have a more traditionally um, conservative view that you know, as we expand, as government expands and grows larger and larger and larger, the expansion of government creates more and more problems. As I said, I'm trying to be as balanced as possible in the presentation of the information. And then lastly, number three, economism, the idea that from a successful economic strategy, there necessarily follows, right, there necessarily follows a continuity of political effects which have been clearly specified, uh, which, which have been clearly specified the idea that the working class represents the privileged agent in which the fundamental impulse of social change resides. I have to change the, the, the wording on that. Basically, the recognition that um, the economist and political effects of sort of econo economic growth are going to coincide. And this is at part what's at stake in the contemporary grievances with respect to Occupy Wall Street. It's that we need our political institutions to make sure that they do what's in the best interest of us, the people, not them, the corporations, right? Um, and this is, this is really the source of the tension, right? It is a very tense, very tender spot within Occupy Wall Street because people are losing their jobs wholesale, people aren't able to find work, people are um, gradually approaching, maybe not generational, um, poverty, but you can see how this could be the beginning of something as grievous as generational poverty. We're not, we're nowhere near that now, right? Where from 2008 to 2011, you can imagine that someone has been unemployed for the duration of that time period, which is in itself a, a, a very long, substantial amount of time to be without work. And you can sense then that within Occupy Wall Street, the grievances are going to be economic, Right? Because of the disparity of income, so much to the top, not enough to the bottom, but also the political mechanisms in place to, su to support and facilitate that disparity. Right? The question then becomes, and this is the key point, the question then becomes how do we attempt to remedy that distinction, that problem, that imbalance, that inequality, or those inequalities? What you have to recognize is from these three, and this is the authors, right? From the three privileged struggles, the assumption is, whether it's right or wrong is not necessarily relevant, but the assumption is that, for example, the master-slave dialectic or the laborer um, and those who own the means of production, that disparity. If it's the, the, statesman, um, the statesman in a statist uh, position, statesman's responsibility to represent on behalf of those that he or she um, serves, that the constituents should see in their representatives and their elected uh, officials, um, individuals who have their interests at stake. And the economic structure that we have in place is such that it needs to facilitate and benefit all not just the 1%, right? And there's varying degrees of these arguments. But the problem is, how do we come to, and the, the deeper problem is how do we come, and I'm trying to make very, very dense literature sort of really boring, really sort of the, you know, um, user-friendly, and then I'll complicate this later. The problem is how do we make sense of these problems? 